In July 1959, a beautiful ocean liner with a slick white hull and a tall buff funnel glid smoothly into Melbourne Station Pier. And this wasn't just any ship, it was the RMS Strathnaver. And she's really important to me and my family because on board that ship, of all the hundreds of immigrant families, there was one little one that contained my grandparents, my father, and my auntie. But Strathnaver was important for a huge number of other reasons, because when she was first introduced in 1931, she represented a huge technological step forward for her owners, the P&O line, and completely changed the way that they would build and operate ships into the future, and here's why. Today, P&O is a household name in the cruising industry, but some would be interested to know that you can trace the line's history all the way back to 1822. From the mid-19th century and into the 20th, it came to dominate many of the world's passenger and cargo shipping lanes, with an expansive fleet of ships so ubiquitous that by 1910 it would have been difficult to find a port in the Far East which did not have a P&O liner with its stark black funnels tied up or at anchor. Their empire spanned the globe, a perfect mirror image of the influence of the British Empire itself. Wherever Britons needed to go, p and would take them there. For decades, p and liners looked like this. So, how did the company end up with a ship looking like Strathnaver? p and had built an empire on tradition. Their ships were solid, built by some of the greatest shipbuilders of the era, like the famous Harland & Wolfe shipyard. But in the First World War, the company took a massive hit, losing no fewer than 85 ships to enemy action. Coming into the 1920s, the company needed to drastically rebuild its fleet, so to do it, they turned to a formula which had always worked for them. Steady, reliable ships with stuffy, timber-clad interiors. p and mantra was a little bit like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So right out of the gate after the First World War, p and puts in an order for two near-identical sister ships intended for the Australia run, Multan and Meloja. Externally, these two sisters looked really similar to p and first Multan and Meloja of 1905 and 1910 respectively. This set the pattern for p and into the 1920s, classic looking liners with black hulls, black funnels and superstructures painted a lovely drab colour, which the p and line executives called stone. Their ships mostly ignored fancy turbine engines for the rugged and reliable expansion steam engine, which had powered their ships since the 19th century. They wouldn't be breaking any speed records, but they didn't need to. They would chug along at the nice, happy speed of 15 knots. Smoking rooms were out of bounds to women still, and p and ships carried twice as many first class as second class passengers, just as they always had. All was right with the world. But then there came a shock. The world had changed. The Edwardian era had given way to the Jazz Age. Art Deco was chic. Timber-clad Edwardian smoking rooms were antiquated. Everything about p and entire fleet screamed outdated. The dark paint scheme had originally been completely practical. During bunkering or refueling, the coal-fired ships would get absolutely covered in coal dust, and their funnels would slowly blacken thanks to the soot from the smoke. Keeping everything a dark colour would obviously hide the muck, but by the 1920s, ships had become oil-fired. They didn't require the arduous coal bunkering process anymore. So therefore, P&O ships didn't need to be dark and drab. Although the P&O line basically ran a monopoly on many Far Eastern routes after it had assumed control of the British India Steam Company, and also had a majority stake in its chief rival, the Orient Line, the fleet looked old and a little bit sad. Something drastic needed to be done, so P&O's chairman, Lord Inchcape, thought about the conundrum and came up with a plan. It called for a pair of ships the likes of which the world had never really seen before. They would be named Strathnaver and Strathaird. Everything about these two near-identical sister ships would be revolutionary for P&O Line. First and most obviously was the exterior design. Visually, the ships were huge, but at about 22,000 gross registered tons, they were not a massive size upgrade over preceding liners on the Australian run, like Multan, which came in at 20,000 gross registered tons. They just looked bigger and more powerful 
because instead of following the traditional lines of an Edwardian liner, low, sleek, and with little superstructure above the hull, Strathnava and Strathaird were tall, and they had huge, towering superstructures that made them look solid. Instead of the older, tall, narrow funnels, Vickers Armstrong, the shipbuilders, had opted for three squat round funnels, two of which were actually dummies intended to balance out the exterior. Because the two ships would be oil-fired, they only needed one funnel to vent the fumes. But there was another huge advantage here. The ships would no longer need to be painted black. Instead, p and went for a dramatic change. The ships would be painted all white, with beautiful buff funnels and masts. Just look at this comparison. Here is what Strathnava would have looked like if she was painted in the traditional way, and here is how she looked in her smart new getup. Yeah, it's a pretty big difference. On the inside too, Strathnava set an absolutely marvellous new standard of luxury for the England to Australia run. Long gone were the dark, stuffy smoking rooms, and in their place were lush lounges thickly carpeted with beautiful art deco artwork and furniture. First class was downsized, and on introduction, there was actually no third class. Instead, much of the ship's accommodation was taken up by the new tourist class to reflect the growing size of the population, which today we refer to as middle class. For the first time in history, people who weren't super rich had means to travel, and so on Strathnaver they could do it in style and comfort. They had access to lounges, libraries, and nurseries for the children, all beautifully decorated and very smart. To emphasize the point, Lord Inchcape directed that even the menus and printed material would showcase gorgeous Art Deco scenes and drive home that Strathnava was a new ship for a new era. But wait, now in my hands, I'm holding a book. That's not just any book. This was actually printed for the operators of Strathnava and Strathaird and possibly even kept down in the engine rooms. And when you open it up, like I did for the first time, you might be a bit disappointed to not see any cool illustrations of engines or turbines. But no, the focus is on electric circuits and generators. The real secret to Strathnaver's revolutionary approach lay down in the engine room, because instead of plodding expansion steam engines, which, albeit, were reliable, there was a set of fancy new turbo electric engines in their place. Instead of driving the propellers directly, the turbines generated electricity, and then electric motors powered the propellers. This meant that you could control the speed of the propellers without need for a complex, fragile gearbox, while also providing enough electricity to power all the ship's lights, all the communication systems, and everything else. Piendo had actually tested this on the Viceroy of India, which was built only two or three years before Strathnaver's introduction, but from the outside you just couldn't tell it, because it looked so old. Older P&O ships, like Multan of 1919, put an emphasis on cargo carrying, meaning the ships were covered in cranes and booms. Multan had no fewer than 16 of these huge hydraulic cranes which towered over the boat deck. But Strathnaver and Strathaird prioritised passenger capacity over cargo. Strathnaver would carry 1,170 passengers to Multan's 660. This meant that instead of towering cargo handling machinery cluttering the decks, Strathnaver's decks were clean and open, and they featured deck tennis courts, and even a veranda cafe for tourist class with stylish wicker furniture. Lastly, even the name was a break from tradition for P&O. Previously, their liners were named for cities in the colony, like Chitral, Multan, Medina, Narkanda, and so on. This was decidedly colonial and a holdover from the 19th century. Instead, Strathnaver was named for Lord Inchcape himself, who was an Earl of Strathnaver in Sutherland, Scotland. Strathnaver was finished in 1931 and sailed on her maiden voyage, but it wasn't without incident. For efficiency, the ship was fitted with propellers that turned inward and not outward, as was tradition. This had an adverse effect on manoeuvrability, and the ship proved to be a little bit of a handful at first. She even ran aground briefly in the Suez Canal. This was later rectified with no noticeable effect on the engine efficiency. Another small problem that was never really solved was more cosmetic, and it involved the funnels. Of course, only the centre funnel was operational, so the oil smoke slowly turned the top of that funnel black and grimy, while the other two funnels remained pristine, which gave away the illusion somewhat. 
Despite these little teething troubles, Strathnaver was met with absolute enthusiasm by the public. So much so that, even in the face of the Great Depression, P&O went on to complete the sister ship Strathaird in 1932, and then order three running mates through the rest of the 1930s, named Strathmore, Strathallan, and then Strathedon. Each was progressively bigger than Strathnaver, but obviously built to the same standard which that ship had set, featuring a smart white hull, buff funnels, and slick Art Deco interiors. All of these ships would have fascinating careers, and I'll probably do a video on each at some point, but suffice it to say that P&O's gamble was an absolute success, and from then on, all new ships would follow the precedent set by the Strathnaver in 1931. And to this day, P&O ships feature smart, white hulls. The last black hulled P&O liners in service, Multan and Meloja, were retired and scrapped in 1954. Strathnaver herself had a very long career, serving during the Second World War as a troop ship and finally as a single class immigrant liner in the 1950s, which is when she carried my family to Australia. Which is also why I have the accent that I do. Thanks a lot, Strathnaver. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. Every little bit helps, and I aim to make a video like this once every week, so you'd hate to miss out. Or you can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.